March 29, 1975, was a seemingly ordinary day in the busy city of Montreal. The area was filled with anticipation for the upcoming Easter celebrations. 16-year-old Sharon Pryor awoke with excitement, ready to immerse herself in the festive spirit. Little did she know that this regular Easter evening would take a sinister turn, forever shrouding her whereabouts in mystery. Sharon's friends eagerly awaited her arrival at Marina's Pizzeria. Time ticked by, but Sharon never reached the familiar hangout. The night swallowed her presence, leaving behind a trail of questions and a community gripped by fear. What happened to Sharon Pryor on that fateful evening? Was her disappearance a cruel twist of fate or a sinister act? Welcome back to Mysterious Hook where we shed light on the mysterious cases from across the country. Today we embark on a journey into the abyss, exploring the haunting disappearance of Sharon Pryor, a vibrant 16-year-old girl who vanished into the night in 1975. Join us as we uncover the chilling details that have eluded detectives for about half a century. But first, if you still haven't subscribed to our channel, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell icon below, as it motivates us to create more intriguing content for you. So without further ado, let's dive right into this mystery. Montreal, a vibrant city in Canada, nestled on the banks of the St. Lawrence River, captivates with its unique blend of old-world charm and modern dynamism. Home to over 1.7 million people, this cultural melting pot embraces diversity, and celebrates its multicultural heritage. French and English coexist harmoniously, painting the city with a bilingual tapestry of languages. From the stunning architecture of Old Montreal, to the bustling neighborhood of Plateau Mont-Royal, and Mile End, every street exudes a vibrant energy. And this is the backdrop to the chilling story of Sharon Pryor. On the chilly day of February 9, 1959, in the vibrant city of Montreal, Canada, a girl named Sharon Kim Pryor was born. Her parents, Yvonne and George Pryor, were filled with boundless joy at the arrival of their firstborn. Yvonne, born in England, had migrated with her parents to settle in Point St. Charles, locally known as The Point, a neighborhood in the borough of Le Sud Ouest, in the city of Montreal, Quebec, Canada. It was there that she met George, a dedicated soldier in the Canadian Armed Forces. Despite his devotion to duty, love intervened, and their connection grew into marriage. Overjoyed by their union, Yvonne and George eagerly awaited the arrival of their first child. Their anticipation reached its pinnacle on Sharon's birthday, as they welcomed a beautiful baby girl into their lives. Sharon's innocent face and radiant smile brought immense happiness to her parents' hearts but fate had more in store for the Pryor family. Just a day before Sharon's second birthday, on February 8, 1961, Yvonne gave birth to twin sisters, Doreen and Maureen. In the eyes of little Sharon, they were the best birthday present she could have ever wished for. However, life is full of twists and turns, and in 1962, George received transfer orders that would uproot the family from Point St. Charles to Manitoba. In their new surroundings, the Pryor family welcomed their youngest addition, George Jr., but alas, even the strongest bonds sometimes fray. And in 1965, Yvonne and George decided to part ways. Yvonne, now a resilient single mother, returned to her beloved Point St. Charles. Yvonne's decision to return to the Point was not arbitrary. It was a deliberate choice rooted in love and practicality. The neighborhood with its affordable living and tight-knit community, promised a safe haven for her children to thrive in. From an early age, Sharon exuded a gentle, caring nature that extended to the world around her. Animals found solace in her presence, as she often took in strays, tenderly nursing them back to health. Her twin sisters, Doreen and Maureen, often reminisced about Sharon's dreams of becoming a veterinarian. Sharon, initially reserved, discovered a welcoming community that embraced her. The Boys and Girls Club provided a space where her interest thrived, particularly through her active involvement in floor hockey and artistic pursuits. In the midst of their teenage years, 
Sharon discovered solace in the presence of a young man named John. Their love story held a touch of destiny, as John had been Sharon's secret crush since the fourth grade days. As time passed, their friendship deepened and blossomed into a profound romance. Sharon also had a close-knit circle of friends, whether it was roaming the streets of Point St. Charles, discovering hidden nooks and crannies, or gathering at the local hangout spot to revel in carefree conversations. Their bond was unbreakable. Through it all, Sharon remained grounded and appreciative of her mother, Yvonne, who had selflessly devoted herself to the well-being of her children. Sharon recognized the sacrifices her mother had made and cherished the unwavering love and guidance she provided. On the eve of Easter, Saturday, March 29, 1975, 16-year-old Sharon Pryor's day unfolded with a sense of anticipation. As the clock struck 1 p.m., Sharon had begun her Easter weekend by completing her morning routine, breakfast, washing up, getting dressed, and tidying her bed. Meanwhile, her mother Yvonne headed out for some last-minute Easter dinner shopping. Jojo, Sharon's 11-year-old brother, and Stephen, the 4-year-old foster child, were still eager to search for Easter eggs. Sharon wanted to make the day extra special for them. With creativity in mind, Sharon decided to make and paint Easter eggs. She boiled eight eggs and left them cool. At 3 p.m., Yvonne returned home and joined Sharon at the kitchen table, watching her paint the eggs. Sharon asked if the paint would dry in time for the next day. Yvonne suggested painting half the eggs in the egg cups and finishing the rest later. Around 3.45 p.m., Sharon realized it was time to pick up her Leo Boys jacket from the Boys and Girls Club. The Boys and Girls Club provided opportunity for children to play in a variety of sports, from basketball to hockey, without it costing the families anything. And when it started in 1952, the association consisted of two teams made of 30 or more children, and every child got a green Leo's jacket that was earned through selling raffle tickets. Sharon had sold enough raffle tickets to get her very own jacket, Excited, she asked Yvonne if she could take Stephen with her. Yvonne agreed, and off they went. Unfortunately, when Sharon arrived at the club, they did not have her size. Disappointed, she received a receipt to claim it another day. She thought about getting a smaller size for Stephen, since he needed a fitting spring coat. On her way back, she dropped off her friend's jacket. Back home by 4.15 p.m., Sharon continued painting the remaining Easter eggs. Then around 4.30 p.m., the reverend paid a visit to their home. He greeted them and brought them a large box of chocolate turtles for everyone to enjoy. They gathered around the kitchen table and while Sharon painted, she asked her mom if they had a book about the Easter Bunny to read to Stephen. The reverend suggested that Sharon share the true story of Easter and she gladly accepted the opportunity. Between 6 and 7 p.m., Sharon's close friend, who happened to live on the same block as her, arrived at her house. They had known each other since they were both five years old, forming a deep bond over the years. Despite their long-standing friendship, they didn't frequently spend time together with Sharon's group of friends, likely due to attending different high schools. As Sharon excitedly shared her plans to go to Marina's Pizzeria, they indulged in lighthearted banter and playful teasing. Her friend couldn't help but laugh at the amusing sight of Sharon constantly changing her tops and scrutinizing herself in the mirror striving to achieve that perfect look. Ultimately, after much deliberation, Sharon decided to borrow one of her mother's tops, adding a touch of familiarity to her ensemble. Marina's Pizzeria, a local hangout located on the corner of Wellington and Ash Avenue, held a special place in Sharon's social circle. It served as a popular meeting spot for her friends, where they could gather and engage in lively conversation about various topics, such as boys and the latest music trends. The restaurant was conveniently located just five short blocks away from Sharon's house. As Sharon prepared to leave, she bid farewell to her mother, who reminded her to be cautious. Worried about the rainy weather, Sharon contemplated whether to wear her brown suede jacket, fearing it might get damaged. Her mother assured her that it was merely drizzling outside and not enough to harm the jacket, alleviating her concerns. With a final goodbye to her mother, Sharon headed out the door her mother's cautionary words lingering in her mind. Outside, her friend was already waiting on the sidewalk. She kindly offered to accompany Sharon on her walk to Marina's, but Sharon politely declined, 
appreciating the gesture nonetheless. Crossing the street, Sharon embarked on her journey, excited about the evening of fun and camaraderie that awaited her at the beloved pizzeria. Sharon's friends eagerly anticipated her arrival, but to their surprise, she never showed up. They assumed that she had accompanied John and the other boys they usually hung out with to a hockey game. However, when the game ended and the boys arrived at the restaurant, Sharon was nowhere to be found. In fact, none of them had seen her throughout the entire night. Meanwhile, back at Sharon's home, the situation mirrored the confusion and worry. Sharon had surpassed her curfew without any communication to her mother, leaving her concerned. Yvonne grew increasingly anxious as this behavior was completely out of character for her daughter. Determined to ensure Sharon's safety, Yvonne decided to stay awake and wait for her return. As the clock struck 1.30 a.m., Yvonne found herself positioned in the living room, anxiously peering out the window while the twins from their bedroom window joined in the watchful vigil. Sadly, there was no sign of Sharon. The following morning, Yvonne embarked on a mission to gather information, reaching out to Sharon's friends and even contacting John. However, none of them had any knowledge of Sharon's whereabouts or had seen her recently. The lack of information only deepened Yvonne's concern and heightened the mystery surrounding Sharon's disappearance. During one of the calls, Yvonne spoke with Sharon's friend, Mary, and she shared disturbing information with her. Mary told Yvonne that a woman named Cheryl Waugh had been attacked on Ash Avenue after 7 p.m. Yvonne couldn't help but worry upon hearing this news, as the direction in which the assailant fled could potentially intersect with Sharon's path. Cheryl, the victim of the attack, recounted the terrifying incident. The assailant had brandished a knife and forcibly grabbed her. Fortunately, before he could cause harm, another passerby intervened, scaring off the attacker. Cheryl provided a description of the assailant, mentioning his blue eyes, a mustache with squared corners, and a low, calm voice. She noted that he was wearing blue jeans, a dark blue ski jacket, and black shoes with pointed toes. Learning about this attack heightened Yvonne's anxiety, considering the possibility that Sharon might have encountered the same assailant. To gather more evidence, Cheryl was brought in to identify her attacker, but her certainty wavered, making it difficult to press charges against anyone. Yvonne grappled with the fear that her daughter may have fallen victim to a similar assault. The lack of concrete information and the uncertainty surrounding Sharon's whereabouts only intensified her worry and further emphasized the urgency of finding her. In a desperate attempt to find Sharon, a massive search operation was initiated, mobilizing hundreds of residents who combed the streets, hoping to locate the missing 16-year-old girl. Despite the collective efforts, the search yielded no results. Yvonne, consumed by worry and desperation, took to the television, appealing to the community for any information that could lead to Sharon's safe return. Unfortunately, this plea also failed to provide any substantial leads or progress in the investigation. As the days passed, a disheartening sense of uncertainty settled upon everyone involved. Some individuals began to speculate that Sharon may have chosen to run away, but her family adamantly rejected this notion. They couldn't fathom the idea that she would willingly abandon the life she loved, a life encompassing her family, friends, and boyfriend. Furthermore, there were no apparent indications or clues suggesting that Sharon had planned to leave her life behind. Notably, she had left behind her bus pass and money at her family's house before embarking on her visit to the pizzeria. Amidst the mounting despair, Yvonne and her family clung to the hope that Sharon would be found safe and sound. The lack of progress in the search and the absence of concrete information only intensified their anguish, leaving them yearning for answers and closure. On April 1, 1975, at around 6 a.m., Yvonne Pryor noticed Ronnie knocking on her friend's door across the street early in the morning. Sensing something was amiss, she approached him, took the newspaper he was holding, and quickly returned home. Yvonne couldn't resist the urge to unravel the truth within the pages. As she opened the newspaper, her worst fears were confirmed. She recognized the picture of her daughter. She uttered with certainty, I knew it was her. I knew her shoes. The photograph displayed a body lying in the snow, discovered in Longwell Field, 
a city approximately 25 minutes away from their neighborhood. Devastated by the news, Yvonne immediately contacted the police to seek confirmation, although she was too distraught to personally identify the body. Instead, she entrusted her brother with the painful task. Ultimately, it was confirmed that the body found was indeed Sharon. The entire community in the point, including her friends, came across the story in the newspaper, and like Yvonne, they were convinced of the tragic truth. Sharon's life had been brutally taken. Sharon's body was discovered by Jacques Beltran, a beekeeper. Jacques had received word that the gate to his apiary had been left open, which was highly unusual. Recalling that he had locked it the night before, he proceeded to investigate. To his surprise, he stumbled upon a partially nude body lying in the snow, approximately 75 feet from the road. Immediately recognizing the gravity of the situation, Jacques promptly contacted the police marking the beginning of a harrowing investigation. Sharon's murder was a horrifying and brutal act of violence. She had been subjected to assault and severe beatings. When her body was found, she was only wearing her suede jacket, a blue sweater, socks, and shoes. Her jeans were discovered a short distance away, while her underwear was found hanging from a nearby tree branch. Disturbingly partially chewed tape was entangled in her hair, and tightly clenched branches were grasped in her hand indicating that she had been alive when her assailant left her in the snow. Examining the scene, investigators uncovered several pieces of crucial evidence. Around 15 feet from the body, tire tracks were found, indicating the presence of a vehicle. Additionally, a blood trail was observed, leading from the parked car to where Sharon's body lay. The absence of drag marks and the lack of mud on Sharon's shoes and socks suggested that she had likely been carried out of the car leading authorities to suspect the involvement of more than one person due to the apparent ease with which the task was executed. In close proximity to the body, a man's shirt with a size 17 collar and 34-inch sleeves was discovered, believed to have been used as a binding for Sharon's wrist. The size of the shirt led investigators to speculate that the suspect was approximately six feet tall. Not far from the crime scene, an imprint of a right shoe sized eight and a half, was found next to a gatepost. The depth of the imprint indicated that the person responsible may have had a heavier build and must have been at least six foot tall. Further evidence included a ring with the word love inscribed on it, a page from an English magazine featuring a young girl, a gun, a car seat cushion, and a receipt for a jacket bearing the name Sharon Pryor. The subsequent autopsy revealed that Sharon had been held captive for days before her death. The estimated time of her demise was approximately 20 hours prior to the discovery of her body. The coroner's examination exposed a crushed chest, possibly from the killer kneeling on it, resulting in internal hemorrhaging. Sharon had sustained injuries consistent with the use of a pointed object, such as a ring with multiple bruises on her face, fractures on both sides of her jaw, a broken nose, and a hole in her cheek, possibly caused by a loose tooth during the assault. On April 4, 1975, a somber gathering took place at St. Matthew's Presbyterian Church, as approximately 200 mourners gathered to bid farewell to Sharon Pryor and pay their final respects. The atmosphere inside the chapel was heavy with grief and sorrow, as friends, family, and members of the community came together to mourn the tragic loss of a young life. The mourners, deeply wounded by the cruel fate that had befallen Sharon, joined in solidarity to offer their support and condolences to her grieving family. The chapel was filled with a mixture of tears, heartache, and profound sadness as they grappled with the pain of losing someone so young and full of promise. During the service, memories of Sharon were shared, capturing her vibrant spirit, cherished moments, and the impact she had made on those around her. The eulogies and tributes served as a poignant reminder of the void left behind her untimely departure. As Sharon was laid to rest, the weight of the tragedy and the senseless act of violence that took her life hung heavily in the air. After the missing persons report was filed, the investigation into Sharon's abduction and murder was commenced by Detective Sergeants Jacques Dutrieux and Renaud Lacombe. From the Longwell Police Department, the detectives developed a theory that the killer had driven the vehicle onto the field and disposed of Sharon's body there. They believed that the killer had returned to the vehicle, 
to retrieve Sharon's jeans and underwear, which were found in different locations the same day as when her body was discovered. The heavier jeans had fallen to the ground, while the underwear ended up on a tree branch. This led the investigators to speculate that the killer was familiar with the local area. The field where Sharon's body was discovered belonged to a beekeeper and was usually padlocked. However, the padlock had been left unhooked, allowing the killer to drive their truck onto the frozen ground. Although the vehicle got stuck in the mud at one point, the frozen mud left behind tire tracks that the police hoped to use to identify the killer's vehicle. The remote location of the crime scene was believed to have been chosen because the field would not be used by the beekeeper until late spring. It appeared that the killer had expected Sharon's body to remain undetected in the frozen field for an extended period. Based on the evidence, the police suspected the involvement of more than one person in Sharon's abduction and murder. They found a trail of blood leading from the tire tracks to where Sharon's body had been dumped. Since there was no mud on Sharon's shoes, it was deduced that she had been carried the entire distance of 15 feet, possibly by two individuals. One theory considered by the detectives was that Sharon had accepted a ride from someone, possibly a passing trucker, on her way to the restaurant and had been attacked and left in the field. Another theory proposed that Sharon had been abducted and held captive for three days before being killed and her body being disposed of. Greg McCreary, a profiler who had worked with the FBI, dedicated his efforts to developing theories surrounding the Sharon Pryor case. Through his analysis, McCrary formed several conclusions about the attacker. He believed the perpetrator to be a younger individual, possibly in his 20s, who was likely residing in the local area with his parents. McCrary also posited that this wouldn't have been the attacker's first offense. He likely had prior experience. Additionally, McCrary suggested that the same assailant who attempted to harm Cheryl could very well be the person responsible for Sharon's murder. He explained that when killers enter their hunting mindset, they become more inclined to take risks, such as committing a second abduction. McCrary considered the probability of two separate individuals intending to abduct women simultaneously in the same small low-crime area to be statistically unlikely. Therefore, it seemed more plausible that the attacker was the same in both cases. The profile further emphasized that the attacker's familiarity with the area particularly the disposal site, since these locations are considered high risk, the assailant would have needed to know the exit points and choose a place that was familiar and provided comfort. McCrary also identified signs of sadistic behavior in the attacker, such as holding a victim captive for days aligned with the sadist pattern. Understanding this pattern can potentially assist in narrowing down the list of suspects. McCrary explained that sadists typically seek compliant victims within their social circle. They initially appear nice and charming, particularly to vulnerable young women. Over time, they become increasingly demanding, exerting control and eventually resorting to degrading and violent behavior. Once compliant victims are no longer available, they may turn to escorts or individuals known for being strange or violent. When even that avenue is exhausted, they resort to hunting strangers. Based on his analysis, McCrary advised the police to investigate individuals with a history of minor domestic arrest or solicitation, as they could potentially fit the profile of Sharon's killer. He also noted that the assailant on the street, who used a knife to try to abduct Cheryl, lacked strong interpersonal skills. This indicated that the attacker knew he couldn't manipulate her with sophisticated deception and resorted to violence instead. The wounds found on Sharon's face further suggested that her killer lacked the skills necessary to maintain control, leading him to rely on violence. McCrary concluded that since the abduction seemed to be carried out by a stranger, the perpetrator would likely be classified as a serial offender. Serial murders of this nature rarely cease their activities on their own, making it crucial to pursue an aggressive investigation to bring the killer to justice. The Longville Police Department Grappling with the investigation into Sharon Pryor's brutal murder, harbored concerns that her tragic death might be connected to the killings of other girls. One such murder was of Norma O'Brien, a 12-year-old girl who had been found lifeless in a field near Chattagoy the previous summer. Norma had suffered assault and mutilation, and like Sharon, 
she had died as a result of asphyxiation. Approximately a year later, the disappearance of 14-year-old Debbie Fisher intensified the police's worries. Debbie had set off on her bicycle from her uncle's residence, intending to reach her family's home just 10 minutes away. However, she never arrived, prompting an immediate investigation by the authorities. Her disappearance occurred in close proximity to where Norma O'Brien had vanished the year before. Tragically, Debbie Fisher's lifeless body was discovered in an abandoned car in the woods. She had been brutally beaten with a rock. While Sharon Pryor's case remained unresolved, a breakthrough occurred in the investigation into Debbie Fisher's murder. The police were able to apprehend a suspect, a minor who was only a few years older than Fisher herself. Due to a publication ban, the public was restricted from knowing the killer's identity, and he was referred to as simply MX. The perpetrator served his time in prison, but was eventually released. The unsettling connection between these tragic cases highlighted the deep concern within the community and law enforcement about a potential serial killer operating in the area. Despite interviewing 38 individuals in connection with the case, including suspects like Frank Daly, also known as Jerry Moore, the manager of the pizzeria, and several individuals associated with him, as well as beekeeper Jacques Beltran, his co-owner Roger Augury, and Raymond Ahmed, the owner of the adjacent property. The police were unable to gather sufficient evidence to bring charges against anyone. Even Sharon's close friends and boyfriend were interviewed, but no breakthrough emerged from these inquiries. As time passed, leads dried up, and information ceased to come in. Despite the detective's confidence in the evidence collected, the case eventually went cold, leaving Sharon's murder unresolved. In the year 2000, Yvonne wrote a letter to the police requesting a review of evidence in Sharon Pryor's case. Yvonne hoped that the advancements in technology could shed new light on the investigation. However, her request was denied a week later, as the police had discarded the majority of the evidence in 1995. This news left Yvonne feeling hurt and distraught, but she persisted in asking the police to locate Sharon's clothing, which fortunately had been preserved. The clothing was analyzed, and finally, the police obtained a DNA sample that did not match Sharon's. In July 2004, the police received a tip regarding a garage space where Sharon might have been held captive. The garage was situated behind an apartment building, and the hope was to find some of Sharon's DNA for further investigation. Three samples were collected, but unfortunately, none of them matched Sharon's or the profile of her murderer. An update in 2012 involved an anonymous donor increasing the reward to $10,000 and establishing a dedicated phone line for tips. This development sparked speculation among the public, suggesting that new information had surfaced. Another avenue explored was the hypnosis session conducted on the woman who saved Cheryl Waugh, hoping to extract additional details from that fateful day. Following the session, the police presented her with several photos, and one man stood out to her. The man in question was William Patrick Fife, a convicted Canadian serial killer responsible for the deaths of five women in Montreal, although he claimed to have killed as many as nine. Fife's first known killing occurred in 1979 which didn't align with Sharon's case in 1975. There was no evidence connecting Fife to Sharon Pryor, and it remained unclear if the police had compared DNA or thoroughly investigated this lead. Over the years, amateur investigators have attempted to link Sharon's murder with others and have brought forth alleged confessions. One such confession was mentioned in the book The Hard Road by Peter Edwards, which briefly references Sharon's murder and implicates a member of the Montreal Satan's Choice Motorcycle Club named Mike French. However, these claims and suspects have remained speculative, and no definitive evidence has emerged to support them. Despite the speculation and the various leads explored throughout the years, Sharon Pryor's case remained unresolved, leaving her family and community seeking answers and closure. Between July and August 2019, DNA samples from the suspect at the crime scene, including samples from Sharon Pryor's clothing, were sent to Parabon Nano Labs, a company based in Ruston, Virginia, that develops nanopharmaceuticals 
and provides DNA phenotyping services for law enforcement organizations. The purpose was to get a prediction result from the DNA sample, and the prediction result matched a man with fair skin or very fair skin, green or hazel eyes, brown hair, and a selection to other freckles. Then in June 8, 2022, a significant breakthrough was achieved when Montreal Laboratory analyzed the suspect's Y chromosome DNA in comparison with the Pisces database. The analysis results made it possible to target the priority name, Romine or Romaine. Franklin Romine, who had addresses in Montreal and Longwell in the 1970s, emerged as a potential suspect. The tire tracks found at the crime scene were compatible with the vehicle registered under Romine's name in Montreal. Franklin Maywood Romine had an extensive criminal record in the United States and had encounters with the Montreal police. DNA samples were obtained from Romine's two living brothers, who willingly provided them to West Virginia police. Both brothers testified that they believed their brother had committed the murder. Family photos depicted Romine as a tall man with reddish-brown hair and a mustache. Unfortunately, Romine passed away in Canada in 1982 and was buried in West Virginia. The police have strong reasons to believe that Romine is the suspect in Sharon Pryor's case. He was living in Montreal at the time of the crime, was familiar with the abduction scene, and matched the witness description. Additionally, DNA analysis indicated a connection between the DNA found at the crime scene and the Romine family. Romine also matched the description of a man who had attempted to kidnap Cheryl Waugh at knife point in close proximity to where Sharon Pryor disappeared. Documents filed in court revealed that one of Romine's brothers confessed that Romine had attempted to abuse his wife. The analysis of DNA from the Romine family indicated a strong likelihood of a familial connection to the crime scene DNA. To further investigate the potential link, Romine's body was exhumed with the consent of the court, despite opposition from his sisters and two brothers due to religious beliefs. On May 8, 2023, the DNA from Romine's remains was being tested at Montreal Laboratory, and the results are expected to be available by approximately May 22, 2023. The new suspect, Franklin Romine, was not among the more than 100 individuals previously investigated by police in connection with Sharon Pryor's murder. The identity of Romine as a suspect came as a surprise to the Pryor family's lawyer, Mark Bellamar. Although he had not discussed the matter with the family, Bellamar emphasized the importance of additional information in cases of missing or murdered individuals and expressed hope that this new development would bring some comfort to the prior family. The ongoing testing and investigation surrounding Franklin Romine and the potential DNA match have raised hopes of finally obtaining answers and justice in the unresolved case of Sharon Pryor's murder. The friends and family of Sharon Pryor have been deeply affected by her tragic murder and have shared their thoughts and memories about her. Yvonne Pryor, Sharon's mother, still living in the neighborhood of Point St. Charles, sent a powerful message through a friend, urging all mothers to watch over and love their daughters. Yvonne Pryor, Sharon's mother, shared her feelings with the media and expressed her enduring hope that the person responsible would one day be found. She spoke of Sharon's loving nature, saying, Everybody loved her. She was just wonderful to be around. Sharon's sister, Doreen Pryor, reflected on the loss and wondered what her sister's life could have been like. She questioned who Sharon would have become, speculating if she would have pursued a career as a veterinarian, which she had shown an affinity for. Doreen's twin sister, Maureen Pryor, expressed her determination to confront Sharon's killer and unravel the truth. She expressed her strong desire to know the identity of the perpetrator, as well as the details surrounding the incident emphasizing her need for answers regarding who, what, when, and where. The Pryor family, friends, and the community as a whole had been waiting for answers for about a half a century, hoping for justice and closure in Sharon Pryor's case. While the recent breakthrough brings a glimmer of hope, it is a reminder of the enduring pain 
and the importance of finding the truth for the sake of Sharon's memory and those who loved her. As we reflect on the recent breakthrough and the impact it had on her friends and family, it's clear that this case has left an indelible mark on the community. Now we'd like to hear from you. What are your thoughts on the developments in this case? Do you have any theories or insights you'd like to share? We encourage you to leave your comments below and engage in a discussion about this case. If there's a case you'd like us to cover, don't hesitate to share your suggestions or drop your recommendations in the comments section below. To stay updated on our latest investigations and true crime stories, remember to like, subscribe, and stay tuned.